At the beginning of this course, we reviewed extensive data showing that differences in behavior are a major contributor to existing disparities in both life expectancy and quality of life. Among the behaviors we looked at, we saw that educational attainment and health-related behaviors as an adult are major contributors to these disparities. We also saw clear evidence that the experience of inequality is directly associated with these behaviors, especially when economic inequality is combined with the social inequality of racial discrimination. A child growing up in disadvantaged circumstances appears to be at risk of developing strikingly different patterns of motivation and behavior than a child growing up in more advantaged circumstances. Having also explored the development of behavior through a consideration of neural development, cognitive development, and the development of personality traits and motivational patterns, we are now in a position to identify the specific mechanisms through which inequality impacts behavior and, as a consequence, well-being. Beginning in 2000, a series of reports by national research agencies began to focus on these issues. One of the first was a report by an interdisciplinary group established jointly by the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, titled From Neurons to Neighborhoods, the Science of Early Childhood Development. The charge to the committee was to update scientific knowledge about the nature of early development and the role of early experiences, and to discuss the implications of this knowledge base for early childhood policy, practice, professional development, and research. In reviewing the scientific evidence available at that time, the report concluded that abundant evidence from the behavioral and the neurobiological sciences has documented a wide range of environmental threats to the developing central nervous system. These include chronic stress stemming from abuse or neglect throughout the early childhood years and beyond. The report identified a series of policy recommendations to address these issues, summarizing these recommendations by concluding that the critical agenda for early childhood intervention is to advance understanding of what it takes to improve the odds of positive outcomes for the nation's most vulnerable young children and to determine the most cost-effective strategies for achieving well-defined goals. The Institute of Medicine issued a second report in 2001 titled Health and Behavior, the Interplay of Biological, Behavioral, and Social Influences. In this report, a committee of scientists from a range of disciplines reviewed the available research that addressed the issues of the mechanisms through which health and behavior are linked. One of its principal findings identified the link between the biological processes involved in early childhood development and the social context in which the child grows up. As described in the report, a fundamental finding of the report is the importance of the interaction of psychosocial and biological processes in health and disease. Psychosocial factors influence health directly through biological mechanisms and indirectly through an array of behaviors. Social and psychological factors include socioeconomic status, social inequalities, social networks and support, work conditions, depression, anger, and hostility. In 2003, a group of scholars established the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, based at Harvard University's Center for the Developing Child. On its website, the council is described as a multidisciplinary collaboration of scientists and scholars from universities across the U.S. and Canada designed to bring to the science of early childhood and early brain development to bear on public policy decision-making. In 2005, the group published a working paper titled excessive stress disrupts the architecture of the developing brain, in which they concluded that the neural circuits for dealing with stress are particularly malleable or plastic during the fetal and early childhood periods. Toxic stress during this early period can affect developing brain circuits and hormonal systems in a way that leads to poorly controlled stress response systems that will be overly reactive 
or slow to shut down when faced with threats throughout the lifespan. The group emphasized that not all stress is harmful. Stressful events can also be tolerable or even beneficial depending upon how much of a bodily stress response they provoke and how long the response lasts. They identified three different types of stress that children might be exposed to. Positive stress refers to moderate, short-lived stress responses, such as when a child receives an immunization. This kind of stress is a normal part of life, and learning to adjust to it is an essential feature of healthy development. Tolerable stress refers to stress responses that have the potential to negatively affect the architecture of the developing brain, but generally occur over limited time periods that allow for the brain to recover and thereby reverse potentially harmful effects. Examples of tolerable stress might include the death or serious illness of a loved one or a particularly frightening accident. This type of stress is made tolerable through ongoing supportive relationships with adults. By contrast, Toxic stress refers to strong, frequent, or prolonged activation of the body's stress response system. Stressful events that are chronic, uncontrollable, and are experienced without children having access to support from caring adults tend to, tend to provoke these types of toxic stress responses. Examples would include severe chronic abuse, whether emotional or physical, especially during early sensitive periods of brain development. Darlene Francis, a neuroscientist at the University of California, Berkeley, published a paper in 2009 describing how factors in the physical or social environment in which a child grows up can alter the expression of genetic information contained within the human DNA. She described how beginning prenatally, continuing through infancy and extending into childhood and beyond, development is driven by an ongoing inextricable interaction between biology as defined by genetic predispositions and ecology as defined by the social and physical environment. She offers this diagram illustrating how factors in the social and physical environment interact with biological traits to affect behavior, learning, and well-being. She emphasized that environmental factors can actually alter the way inherited genetic information is expressed physiologically through a process referred to as epigenetics. In describing the processes involved with epigenetics, Francis distinguishes between the genome and the epigenome. The genome is the inherited genetic information contained in the nucleotide sequencing of the DNA of the chromosomes. In order for the DNA to convert its genome sequence into actual physiologic outcomes, it unwinds its strands, thus allowing RNA to transfer that information elsewhere in the cell, where it triggers the production of certain proteins. However, at any one time, most genes in the DNA sequence are quiescent. Only certain specific genes are activated to produce proteins. In a process referred to as methylation, the nucleus blocks the inactive genes by attaching methyl groups or other similar chemicals to the nucleotides in those genes. The chemical signals that impede gene expression are referred to as the epigenome. This epigenetic, epigenetic process can either turn off gene expression or slow it down. As Francis describes, the epigenome is innately plastic and can be programmed or reprogrammed by environmental experiences such as nutrition and stress. These epigenetic mechanisms provide the means through which social experiences can fundamentally and profoundly alter the regulation and expression of the genome without altering genotypes. In 1999, Bruce McEwen reviewed current scientific knowledge at the time about how epi epigenetic processes such as these can impact both the structure and the function of the hippocampus in particular. As described by McEwen, the hippocampus is a target of stress hormones and it is an especially plastic and vulnerable region of the brain. The hippocampus undergoes a selective atrophy in a number of disorders 
accompanied by deficits in declarative, episodic, spatial, and contextual memory performance. He goes on to describe a number of studies of hippocampal function in humans and concludes that the human brain shows signs of atrophy as a result of elevated glucocorticoids and severe traumatic stress. In 2013, Luby and colleagues published the results of a study of 145 children between the ages of 6 and 12. The children were assessed for having experienced stressful life events, the quality of care provided by the parent or other caregiver, and the family's socioeconomic circumstances. They then administered an MRI brain scan to each child to evaluate the child's brain structure with particular attention paid to the volume of the hippocampus. The researchers found that children from lower income families, typically having parents with lower levels of education, consistently had reduced hippocampal volume. The researchers then entered into the analysis measures of the stressful life events experienced by the child before entering school and the level of hostile parenting style exhibited by the parents. The authors found that the lower level of family income was associated both with more frequent occurrence of hostile parenting practices and experiencing stressful life events more frequently as a young child. They also, also found that each of these measures, hostile parenting and stressful life events, was independently associated with reduced hippocampal volume. However, after taking into account separate measures of parenting style and having experienced stressful life events, there was no longer a direct association between family income and hippocampal volume. The adverse impact of lower family income and lower parental education seems to be an indirect one with the stressful life events and the hostile parenting styles, the direct causes. In a paper published in 2014, Kin and colleagues reported the results of their study of 76 children between the ages of 7 and 9. The researchers first assessed the level of anxiety exhibited by each child based on parental reports using standardized assessment instruments as well. They then performed an MRI brain scan of the children looking specifically at the size, in this case, of the amygdala. As shown in this graph, when they compared the size of the amygdala with the level of anxiety exhibited by each child, they found a significant positive association. Those children exhibiting greater levels of anxiety also tended to have greater amygdala volume. As shown in this chart, they then compared amygdala volume of the children at particularly high and particularly low levels of anxiety and found a significant difference, especially in the left hemisphere of the brain. From the combined results of these two studies, we're able to conclude that toxic stress experienced by young children can result both in an overactive amygdala and in reduced hippocampal function. A report published in 2011 by the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child underscored the potential long-term impact of these changes on a child's executive function. As the report describes, executive function involves a group of skills that help us to focus on multiple streams of information at the same time, monitor errors, make decisions in light of available information, revise plans as necessary, and resist the urge to let frustration lead to hasty actions. Executive functioning has three principal components, working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive or mental flexibility. The authors underscored the potential long-term impact of reduced executive function. They stated that Scientists who study executive function skills refer to them as the biological foundation for school readiness. They argued that strong working memory, cognitive self-control, and attentional skills provide the basis upon which children's abilities to learn, to read, to learn to write, and to do math can be built. Thus, those children who grow up in a toxic home or parenting environment may be at a substantial disadvantage when they enter school, both in terms of their learning capacity and their emotional and behavioral control. 